Representative Nembro, thank you very much for bringing this bill to us. Do you want to introduce it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's my pleasure. Uh, honorable colleagues, uh, Chairs Thompson and Greenlick, uh, I'm Michael Dembro, State Representative for House District 45. That's Northeast Portland to Park Rose, from the heights of uh, from the heights of Rocky Butte to that little city within a city of Maywood Park. <coughs> and it's a it really is a pleasure for me to come before this uh, committee that uh, I've been missing all session. Uh, it was a pleasure to have been part of it last session um, when we did so <laughs> thank you mr. chair when we did some very exciting things uh, and some very good things for the people of Oregon along the lines of health care reform uh, and I'm thinking most notably of the Healthy Kids Act which extended access to uh, Oregon's uninsured children uh, we're on track to have nearly 80,000 perhaps more than 80,000 Oregon children uh, getting coverage that they didn't otherwise have access to is a really remarkable achievement. Uh, the Oregon Health Authority that was created last session is working to improve the quality of care and to expand the focus on preventative and coordinated care in this state. If things stay on track, uh, an insurance exchange for individuals and small businesses is coming to Oregon sometime soon. Despite these points of progress, though, most experts concede that many long-term problems will remain. First, there will be many people who will still be left out, and that's going to continue to drive up the cost of coverage for the rest of us. Second, for most people, insurance is still going to be tied to employment. So if you lose your job, change your job, or drop below full-time on your job, you're going to have to change your coverage or even worse, you're going to lose your coverage entirely. Third, for the most part, our system will still rely on private insurance companies who charge very high administrative fees, create huge administrative burdens for doctors and other health care professionals, and whose primary interest is their own profits. At best, what we're going to continue to have is an expensive, complicated, fragmented patchwork system. There's a real danger that people are going to fall through the cracks, middle class families are going to pay more, and small businesses are going to continue to be hammered. In addition, we're seeing that there's a, there's a very good chance that the federal reform effort may face real legal challenges. It may well be that it is unconstitutional for government to mandate that individuals purchase a particular product, in this case an insurance product. If the courts rule that way, what path do we have to get to uh, our goal of universal coverage? Fortunately, there's a very simple solution out there, a model that has existed legally and to great effect for the last 50 years, and that's Medicare. Medicare gives us very low administrative fees, individual choice, a high level of care for our most vulnerable and expensive population, and universal access. <coughs> what we need to do is take Medicare, improve it, and extend it to the entire population. That, in a nutshell, is the intention behind House Bill 3510, the Affordable Health Care for All Oregon Act, which you uh, are hearing before you today. It moves Oregon to a comprehensive health care system with universal access in which the cost of health care is spread across the entire population of the state and thereby made affordable. <coughs> Initial modeling shows that we could take the same amount of money that's being spent in Oregon today in the form of premiums, deductibles, copays, and other out-of-pocket payments and obligations and use it to fund a system in which the people of this state become one large self-insured pool and everyone could be covered for that amount of money. Fortunately, the federal uh, health insurance reform did open the door to further experimentation by the states. Thanks in large part to work uh, done by Senator Wyden and recently confirmed by President Obama, states may have a path to try out their own solutions 
As long as they are expanding access to quality health care to more people more affordably. We believe that the Affordable Health Care Act for all Oregon will do that. A wide range of physicians, care providers, health care advocates, and other Oregonians have come together to help craft and support this bill. You'll hear from a few of them. And I should say that the bill is a, the result of many months of conversations uh, among uh, a variety of people, um, and many of these conversations were quite contentious. This is not boilerplate language by any means. This is the result of, of a lot of work and ultimately a vision of what would work uh, for us here in Oregon. We're very excited to be bringing House Bill 3510 to the legislature and to the people of Oregon. You know, one of the real problems of, uh, with the federal reform process last year was that advocates of single payer were never allowed a seat at the table, despite the fact that Medicare is a viable model and many countries around the world have some form of single payer that is working very effectively. For reasons of politics and influence and strategy, it was ruled out before it was even considered. That's wrong. It's bad government, and we need to try to make it right. Co-chairs Greenlick and Thompson, um, in scheduling this hearing, uh, in hearing this bill, you have done the right thing, uh, and we are very appreciative of it. Um, I look forward to, um, to um, presenting to you a variety of, of voices you're going to hear uh, from doctors, from small business owners, from a variety of people uh, about uh, the merits of this approach. I would ask of you just one thing, and that is to take it seriously. Uh, ask the hard questions. Uh, this is, um, I, I believe that we as a nation are at some point going to have a single-payer system. We're going to join the rest of the world. Whether that's going to happen this year or next year or sometime in the future, it will happen. But we need to make sure that it's the best system it can be. And that's going to require you all, with all the expertise that you bring to the, to the table, uh, your um, input, your advice, your challenging. And uh, you'll be hearing from a number of people that I think will uh, help you with that conversation and, and with that. I would be happy to entertain any questions, or you might want to wait for the experts behind me. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify here today and for giving consideration to the Affordable Health Care for All Oregon Act. My name is Paul Gorman. I've been an Oregon physician for 27 years. I've been a rural primary care doctor. I've been an urban HMO doctor. I've been a community hospital managed care doctor and I've been an academic at the university. In all those places I found dedicated nurses, cutting edge technology, and the best doctors in the world. But they're constrained by a system that prevents them from giving care to everyone and produces skyrocketing costs and declining health outcomes. What we're talking about here today with this bill is simple, publicly funded, privately delivered, affordable health care for everyone in Oregon. We all chip in on the cost, and we all have a say in the coverage. Why this bill? Why won't tweaking our current system work? Let's consider the goals of a health care system and how we can achieve them. I believe we have five main goals for a health care system. Access, choice, patient-centeredness, affordability, and accountability. By access, I mean universal access. Health care for everyone, cradle to grave, no exceptions. If you lose your job or you decide to start a small business, you don't have to worry because you and your family can get the health care you need. Other options right now for reform leave thousands of people out with no option but the emergency department. Under the Affordable Health Care for Oregon Act, it leaves no one out. Everyone is covered, cradle to grave. By choice, I mean free choice of providers. Each of us should get to choose the doctor and hospital of our choice for ourselves and our families. We should not be limited only to the doctors on some insurance company list. We should not have to switch doctors because our employer changes insurance plans. 
We should not find the ambulance driving us past one hospital across town to another because it's on the insurance company's list. In the current system, your employer chooses which plan you can buy. The plan chooses which doctors you can see. And you just do what you're told. Under the Health Care for All Oregon bill, we get to decide. We have a choice. By patient-centered, I mean that patients and their doctors decide the best course of treatment. In our current system, the first question your doctor asks is, what's covered, not what's best? You need medication, surgery, or diagnostic tests. One insurance plan may cover it, another one might not. And there are thousands of different plans. So instead of taking time to work with you to work out what's best for you, we doctors spend our time looking up your insurance plan's policies, filling out their forms, waiting for pre-authorization to do what's best for the insurance company. Other reforms do nothing to replace or reduce this nightmare of insurance company paperwork. Under the Oregon bill, all necessary health care services are covered. There's just one set of rules. So your doctor can spend time working with you instead of filling out paperwork. By accountable, I mean that health policy should be public policy with transparency and accountability. In our current system, decisions about coverage and costs are made by insurance company executives looking after the interests of their company. And they are good at it. Top health insurance companies posted record profits in 2009 and 2010, while Oregon and the rest of the nation struggled to make ends meet. Citizens of Oregon have no say in these policies that determine our access to care. It's all done in the back room and the boardroom. Other reform options do nothing to change this complete lack of accountability in health policy. But the Oregon bill creates a publicly accountable board to make decisions about coverage, incorporating public input, ensuring coverage of services that are evidence-based, cost-effective, and emphasize disease prevention and promotion. By affordable, I mean affordable. I mean none of us should go bankrupt because of medical costs, not patients, not governments, not businesses. There should be no co-payments that make care unaffordable for those who need it most. Other reform options do nothing to make co care more affordable, although they may require us to purchase it. We're all just one serious illness away from bankruptcy. Studies conducted in over a dozen states consistently find that only, that only a plan like the Oregon plan can cover everyone and control costs. 45,000 people die each year in America because they have no health insurance. Not because we can't figure out the diagnosis, not because we don't have an effective treatment for them, but simply because we lack the will to do so. That's about 550 Oregon citizens a year. 10 people die in this state every week simply because we bar them at the door. And thousands suffer needlessly, delaying or going without treatment because our health care system refuses to care for them. Today, considering this bill, you have the opportunity to improve more lives and prevent more deaths than I have had in over 30 years of practice. And in the process, you can help make health care more affordable so that Oregon citizens, Oregon businesses, and Oregon governments don't go bankrupt trying to stay healthy. Thank you for your attention. Just for a time check to remind folks, we're 13 minutes into it, and we have uh, about 30 people or so that have signed up to testify. I'll keep reminding you of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to all the committee members. I'm Samuel Metz. I'm an anesthesiologist, and I work at hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers throughout the Willamette Valley. Here's why I support HB 3510 and single-payer health care. It will reduce our state deficit. It will, will create tens of thousands of jobs. It will provide workers and their families with health care, whether they're part-time, full-time, retired, disabled, sick, or unemployed. It will reduce the cost of doing business in Oregon, and it will provide comprehensive health care for every Oregonian without spending more than we're spending now. How does this differ from our current private health insurance financing? Under this plan, all citizens are treated the same. Same benefits, same access, no fragmented risk pools. 
Second, primary care is emphasized. We in medicine know that encouraging patients to consume more, excuse me, more inexpensive primary care drastically reduces the consumption of very expensive tertiary care. And finally, a single payer collects its funds equitably and progressively rather than having a multitude of private plans ration health care on the basis of ability to pay. How can this plan pay for more care for more citizens with less money? By eliminating the $4 billion a year spent in Oregon using private health insurance financing that would be saved with single payer. That is money that we pay in premiums that does not go to health care. Half of that is simply the cost of running an insurance company. But the other half is the money that providers like me and hospitals pay to collect our money from the insurance companies. This is an industry that denies... Dr. Mouse, would you just back off a bit from the mic? I'm sorry. Don't need to blow you away. From here. Yeah, it, it. This is an industry that denies 30% of all first claims. Not because they're bad people, but because it's good business. That $4 billion saved is more than enough additional funding to provide comprehensive, no deductible, no copay, all meds included, comprehensive health care to every Oregonian, young and old. How does the agency get its money? The money is out there. It is already being spent by businesses and families. The challenge is that when these funds get diverted to a single-payer agency, they're relabeled as taxes. Unfortunately, we have many voters who unknowingly pay thousands of dollars in premiums and out-of-pocket payments into a grotesquely inefficient, inefficient system that leaves them vulnerable to bankruptcy. But they're not going to pay a penny of it if it's called a tax, even if it buys them a better product at less cost, like single-payer health care. What about jobs? Single-payer studies nationally and in 14 other states suggest that Oregon can expect about 35,000 new jobs with a single-payer program. That's 12,000 more jobs than there are in the entire Oregon insurance industry. And these jobs are expected to generate about a half billion dollars in new tax revenue. What about businesses? No more labor disputes over health care benefits. The cost of running a human <coughs> resources de department gets cut in half. And entrepreneurs are free to start new businesses about where, without worrying about where they're going to get health care. Business will flourish. What about our state government? All of the payroll and administrative savings for private business apply doubly for the state government. The cost to the state to provide health care benefits for its employees will go down. Tax revenue will go up. In summary, by establishing single-payer health care in Oregon, SB 3510 will reduce the state deficit, create jobs, improve the health of Oregon's business, provide health care for everyone, and spend no more than we spend now. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Doug Bigelow. I am Professor Emeritus at Oregon Health and Science University, Department of Psychiatry. I'm speaking to you uh, as a private citizen here. I appreciate the opportunity to address the honorable representatives today. Our health care costs per capita are double those of all advanced nations and growing fast. While public insurers have been more successful than any other purchaser at containing cost, our public health care expenditures are as great as the entire per capita amount of health, exp health expenditure in single-payer universal health insurance systems. The key to controlling costs is the operating efficiency, purchaser power, and everybody in of single-payer universal health insurance systems. The single-payer system is actually the only business-like, fiscally conservative option, the only option for bending the public expenditures curve. In 1990, I wanted to know how a single-payer system actually worked, the nuts and bolts of one. I went to work in the Ministry of Health in British Columbia, a province very much like Oregon in size, 
demography, and economy. For eight years, I held various positions there and served for a time on the Executive Director's Committee where issues and challenges for the entire health care system are handled as well as the daily management of its operations. I am able to testify to you here today that this system works. It works very well, it is co comparatively inexpensive, and it is very popular. What stymies us here is the deep structural transformation which a transition to the single-payer system will involve. Migrating to a single-payer combines the current multiple streams of revenue for health services into a single health insurance fund. It can be done. Dr. Shaw has developed a plan for managing such a transition in his feasibility study for the state of Vermont, a detailed plan for how you do it. Similarly, payments for physicians, hospitals, lab and other health services will involve selecting or creating a payment entity. Payment will be simpler for everybody to understand, easier to work with and much less expensive to operate. A new price negotiating me mechanism will also be required. Negotiating prices as a single payer will be simpler than the complex, expensive employer by employer insurance shopping, paneling, arbitrary fee scheduling, billing denial, rebilling, and other inefficient as well as futile efforts to control costs in our current multi payer system. I can tell you from my direct participation in the revenue, negotiating, and payment structures of the BC single payer system that they are simple, understood by all, efficient, less costly. And my observations and conclusions are consistent with sophisticated American feasibility studies as well as international comparisons. There is a way out of our fiscally unsustainable situation and House Bill 3510 begins to create that way, maybe even in my lifetime. Thank you very much. Are there any questions of this panel? Thank you very much. Do I have the mic okay? Yeah. Great. Uh, my name is Mark Kellenbeck and I appreciate the opportunity and privilege to address you today. I am the founding co-principal of Cascade Management, a 23-year-old affordable housing and care management company. We have over 350 employees providing services in 32 cities and to over 7,000 residents. When I began in business in 1988 as Kellenbeck Property Management, the predecessor to Cascade Management, we provided full medical coverage to all of our employees and their families. By full coverage, I mean major medical with $150 annual deductible, prescription coverage, vision, and dental. Today, 23 years later, we provide coverage to our employees only no longer cover their families, no longer pay 100% of the premium, with our employees paying 18% of the medical premium and 100% <coughs> of their dental. Today our employees face an annual deductible of 2,000, 80% of the coverage with a stop loss of 4,000. So dramatic difference in 23 years. We know only too well that a majority of our employees are unable to provide medical insurance coverage for their families, the cost of which in most cases is a quarter of their take-home pay, and sometimes as much as their half, half as their take-home pay. As a result, the children of our employees often go without needed medical care. Even our employees themselves who are covered, but due to the high deductible, often choose not to see a doctor or to get proper medical care. If this is not bad enough, our medical insurance rates have more than doubled in the last seven years and would have increased even more had we not raised deductibles, shared increases with employees, and dropped dental coverage. We presently pay $83,000 per month for our share, the company's share, of just over 200 covered employees. Medical insurance now represents a staggering 18% of our total payroll cost and is still growing with no end in sight. Simply put, we and our employees strongly feel we are not getting our money's worth from the current system of medical care and medical insurance, and that we have been captured in what is truly a non-competitive market. 
It seems to us that for $83,000 per month, we ought to be able to buy much more than we can today. Clearly, both our employees and their dependents deserve full access to needed, needed medical coverage for 18% of our payroll cost. The situation is so troubling that it causes one to wonder how our system became so expensive and why we of Americans have fallen so far behind the rest of the world. The statistics speak for themselves and American workers and their families are paying the price for the system that has gone out of control and no longer meets their needs. Being caring and thinking beings, we naturally wonder if it's not time or really past time to consider paying for and providing health care differently. Differently at this point in time almost certainly means making structural change in how to provide and pay for medical coverage. Most of us are very ready for a system of medical care that gets us on plane with and perhaps someday even ahead of the rest of the modern world. The truth is we are presently a third world country when it comes to providing medical care for our citizens or in this case, for my employees. The good news is there exists a proven, efficient, cost-effective, and equitable alternative for providing health care to all Oregonians. I believe it is time, perhaps long past due, and that today we must act intelligently and caringly and take the first steps to make such a system a reality in our great state of Oregon. Oregon ought to once again lead the nation and be the first state to institute a single-payer medical system. Thank you. Thank you. Let's remind you all we're at almost 30 minutes in there. So the briefer you are in your comments, the more folks will be able to testify. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paco Marabona, and I'm the owner of AAA Advanced Benefits insurance and investments in Salishan on, on Lincoln County. For almost 30 years I have uh, and my agents have primarily served Oregonians with health insurance <coughs> as independent agents. <coughs> Due to company and client privacy concerns, you'll appreciate my need to protect specific details. However, today it's very difficult to get good affordable coverage in Oregon for several reasons. One is underwriting. Uh, the, the changes in, in health questions, people that were covered before, like say somebody who had a high blood pressure controlled with, uh, was a smoker, uh, nowadays are turned down, uh, and, and there, there's other, other conditions uh, that time kind of prevents uh, going into. Uh, the other big uh, issue is a rapidly rising premiums. I'm sure you've heard about this or maybe you've experienced it yourself. Many plans, both under and over <coughs> 65, <laughs> have gone up about 20% a year. And uh, some have gone up for more than three to five years. So 60% in three years, they have doubled in four to five years. Uh, some rate increases will range from 15 to 30% annually, while others have had increases as many as two to three times a year. A few Oregonians are getting those kinds of wage increases during the same time period. <coughs> A few Certainly not legislators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nor I. <laughs> I hear about the insurance. Yeah, the insurance company making a lot of money. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, <coughs> you could get a good insurance plan for two to three hundred dollars for an individual. Now they have to pay at least five to six hundred, as much as a thousand to twelve hundred uh, monthly, which in many cases is similar to their mortgage payment. Uh, and that's if they're approved. If not, they go into a, a, the uh, OMIP or one of, the, one of these other pool plans, and they have to pay even more. In addition to that, there's deductibles from 1000 to 10000 and plus additional out-of-pocket payments of another five to $30,000 before the policies really kick in and pick up 100% uh, up to whatever their limits are, like $2 million. Such costs repeated, as well as other costs that are not covered, can cause and can and do cause financial hardship and bankruptcies and are really not sustainable. People without, without insurance tend to shift those costs onto people who have insurance and to providers and hospitals. The legislature requires that in auto insurance everyone have coverage because that's to protect society and, and businesses from losses. Health coverage should be the same. 
Without the cost of health insurance, businesses will be more competitive, and, or, and all Oregonians can be uh, covered by this bill you're considering. And that's why I would support this bill, even though it could cost me my job. Okay? There will be, the single payer plans will create more jobs, but they will eliminate some. In the private sector, jobs like for agents, claims, and support staff. And those people may well deserve, I, I know the bill uh, talks about training and transitioning. The uh, advantages of covering all Oregonians, however, I think, uh, and as well as streamlining the enrollment and payment process that will result in significant savings over the current system and will allow all, not just some, Oregonians to be covered. In the past, Oregon has risen to the challenge. We thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Anderson? You want me to go fast? No. <laughs> fast Hi, I'm John can. Anderson, and I work at a truck stop. <coughs> I actually uh, work at the Truck and Travel in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, it's a family-owned and operated business. I'm the president, so I guess I'm one of the family. Um, <laughs> what does the rest of the family say about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, well, um, anyways, I come to you. In, in, in preparation to my talk today, I, I went back through some old notes, and I decided to use some notes I had from 2004 when I had an opportunity to speak to a body about health insurance. In 1997, our company uh, paid about $110 per employee for health insurance. We have 90 employees, and we are in an industry that doesn't typically provide health insurance for em their employees. In 2003, it was $277. An update, it's just short of $400 a month per employee. We are, as many businesses, struggling to even stay alive in today's economy and environment. The escalations of health insurance premiums are unsustainable, have been, and as my brother and I sit down and look at one another, we try to figure out how we're going to go another year and provide health insurance to our employees. And I don't know, we, we do it, but we struggle at it. Mm -hmm. Society has spoken, in my mind, uh, that health care is a right. It's not, a, not a, a privilege, as we once thought it was. And in this industry of health care, there isn't one facet that I don't believe is not broken. The public's expectations for the care are too high. They, they, they need to be reined in. The medical community, the providers, the uh, hospitals, the pharmaceuticals and the devices, device companies, those, their fees are too high. And also the legal system. Last night, no less than four times, I was offered the opportunity to call an attorney to uh, sign up for uh, a lawsuit to, for my hip, for birth control, <laughs> or for the asbestos I inhaled when I was out playing in, in, in grade school. Society needs a system, and I believe the system needs to be a single payer system, but it needs to encompass all facets. And if you don't encompass all facets, you will, you will not solve the problem. So as you, as you debate this bill and, and carve it up and go through it, address all facets, all of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, Elena Guini. Roberta Hall. We got notes. Yeah, but it's going to be an essay test. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Frank Erickson. The next panel, by the way, will be Jay Thyman, Terry Mills, and Dr. Eusterman. Chair Greenlick, members of the committee, thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Ilana Guinea. I'm with the Oregon AFL-CIO. Our president, Tom Chamberlain, had hoped to be here today. Unfortunately, he had another commitment. Um, you know, we are asked a lot why unions care about health care reform. And 
The simple answer, of course, is that it affects all workers. But more specifically, there are a couple of reasons that we like to weigh in on this topic and that we care so much about this bill. The first is I have not seen anything weigh down contract negotiations for our unions and all of our unions, private, public sector, every part of the economy, <coughs> more than health care negotiations. It slows things down. It stops working people in Oregon from being able to, in good times, receive wages, in bad times, prevent cuts because they're trying so hard to hang on to the health care that they have and not lose coverage for themselves and their families. People sacrifice retirement, they sacrifice income to keep their health care. And second, because as a voice for union members, we also often try to present a voice for all workers in Oregon. And there are so many workers in this state who don't have health care who work every day for enough money to support their families, and if a health care emergency comes up, don't have enough to take care of that emergency, don't have enough to cover the costs, and don't have the health insurance that they need, because that's really what health care has become about, is insurance, to keep their kids safe and healthy. We've had great reforms in Oregon. Most children do have health care. We have the option for all children to have health care. Too many of their parents don't. Too many people still can't afford the costs of that health care coverage. Um, and the second reason that we like to weigh in on bills like this and that we care so much about health care reform is because we have so many members who work both in the health care industries and in other emergency services who know the effects of not having health coverage, who know the effects of not being able to have routine care, not being able to manage conditions. And for all of these reasons, um, we are supporting HB 3510. We support ensuring that all Oregonians have health care coverage. You have a letter going into more details from our president, Tom Chamberlain, and I'll leave it at that so more people can get up here. Thank you very much. It's a good example of expeditious. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for hearing us. Uh, my name is Roberta Hall. I'm a longtime Oregonian resident in Corvallis. I've worked with health issues since 1964 when I was a nursing school librarian, the old hospital school of nursing, if some of you remember. In 1969, I worked with the county health department on my doctoral research. I've worked with Northwest tribes on health care issues and developed courses in the anthropology of health. I'm here to support HB 3510 and advocate for a universal health care system that is not dependent on employer or employment. I represent the Rural Organizing Project, which is affiliated with 65 groups in 28 <laughs> Oregon counties, three nearby me in Lynn and Benton counties. ROP works to create communities accountable to a high standard of human dignity and its affiliates address issues that affect rural people. We support publicly financed universal health care because having access to health care is essential to personal dignity. <coughs> All of us are acquainted with someone hurt by the current health care system. Molly, a member of a Corvallis affiliate of ROP, lives in a trailer park in a rural area between Corvallis and Albany. At 60 years old, she developed throat cancer and was treated for a variety of ailments for about eight months <coughs> until the cancer was finally di diagnosed. Her health insurance has a high deductible and high copay and comes with her husband's employer, a trucking firm. His usual employment takes him out of town for nearly a week at a time, but when Molly became ill, he left these long haul routes to work as an alternative driver between nearby towns so he could come home at night. This work pays much less and requires the driver to hook and unhook the trailer a couple times a working day, which can be 12 hours long. It's much harder physically, especially for a man in his mid-60s, but not working means no health coverage. Friends help Molly, who's attached to a feeding tube while her esophagus recovers from chemo and radiation, by staying with her while her husband works. Meanwhile, the bills mount up and bill collectors call daily. Only if his health holds up and his wife recovers will he return to long-haul routes and then repay, hopefully repay their debts. I moved to Corvallis after living four years in British Columbia, one attraction being the Universal Health Care in BC that attracted us there. 
During those four years, we received the kind of care common in any young family. There was one emergency overnight in a hospital when we were camping. I was accepted, no questions asked, and no delay in care. Health insurance and access to care were not, as they are here, issues that affect every single decision a family makes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Greenlick, uh, for allowing us to present testimony on House Bill 3510. Uh, in the interest of time and due to the excellent testimony that's preceded me, I'm going to shorten my remarks from the verbal that you have in front of you. Uh, I've sent this all along to you in electronic format, so you have it to refer to. Uh, I, my name is Frank Erickson. I'm a board-certified radiologist in rural eastern Oregon. Uh, I'm 30 years out from medical school. Uh, I've spent the last 15 years in Pendleton as a radiologist. I'm a teleradiologist now. I am licensed in 12 other states in addition to Oregon. And I have a, a wide perspective of uh, how healthcare is being delivered right now in, in the United States. Um, I represent several doctors in my part of the state who could not be here but who, are, who tell me they're strongly in favor of this bill. Uh, one of them is my wife, Dr. Gordon, who sends her regards, but she was unable to attend because of a family medical emergency. Her, her testimony has also been submitted to you. Uh, it has been my, uh, the case that over the last two years I've been following this since this effort's been blocked at the federal level, it caught my attention. Uh, and I, I have d accumulated enough information for four hours of hearings. <laughs> I've been reduced to five minutes, so forgive me if I'm a little nervous. Uh, I really want to get the message across. Uh, <coughs> I'm very proud to be an Oregonian at this moment because you have allowed this testimony that was blocked at the federal level. I believe Oregon's version of single payer slash what we call now single risk pool health care presented as House Bill 3510 provides us with the tools to cure a variety of ills created by our current for-profit malfunctioning health processing industry. I chose all those words carefully <laughs> to reflect my opinion on this. Um, You've already heard that there was a Harvard study in 2005 that found 44,000 deaths per year because of under or non-insurance. That uh, adds up to 558 Oregonians in that year. 20.8% uh, of Oregonians in that year were uninsured. It turns out that's almost three quarters of a million people and it adds up to the populations of Portland and Salem combined, just to give you a reference. I believe that as long as there are uninsured people in whatever health care system we have, there are going to be unnecessary avoidable deaths. So the trick is to achieve universal health care. You've got to have them all, got to have universal access or it doesn't work well. And as a doctor, I hate to do harm in the process of conducting health care. Uh, you have to like a bill that in the process of making Oregonians healthier and more productive actually creates an estimated 35,000 jobs. It eliminates over half of all labor disputes. It allows all of Oregon as a group to <coughs> negotiate lower prices for pharmaceuticals and services. Provides local management by district of administrative issues, something we don't have now. It gets every citizen equal access to basic medical and dental care and stops personal bankruptcies for medical misfortunes. I have current personal knowledge of one of my wife's employees who has a family bankruptcy related to medical misfortune. Uh, it turns out in Pendleton, if you have to take a life flight to Portland, which is where the specialists are, it costs $30,000 one way. Uh, there, is an, there is, if you have the presence of mind to buy li uh, life transport ahead of time, and if you can afford it, it won't cost you $30,000. Uh, but it's, it's pretty expensive. Uh, I'm of the opinion that just because you can make money doing something a certain way doesn't make it right, especially if harm is being done in the process. We call these perverse incentives. Those that place profit over people are eliminated by this plan. It offers a cleaner way to practice medicine, restoring decision making to the doctor and the patient. No insurance company, middlemen involved. You've heard enough about that. For-profit health insurance fails to deliver basic health care because it isn't profitable. Current conditions generally favor waiting until patients become sick and then 
trying and often accomplishing dramatic rescues with wonderful but expensive high-tech solutions, rather than preventing the patient from getting sick in the first place. As a former biomedical engineer and a teleradiologist, I really like high-tech equipment and really like to save the day and show the surgeon exactly where to cut and tell him what it is before he goes in there. That's that, there's nothing more pleasing to a radiologist than that. But it would be great if there was something we knew about that would prevent the patient from getting into the surgical situation to begin with. And that just isn't happening right now. Um, so I'd actually be happier on a, on a moral basis, not reading so many CT chest abdomen pelvises. Um, so instead of expending several hundred dollars a year to prevent a stroke and keep people happy, keep, <laughs> keep people healthy and happy, we pay two hundred thousand dollars to treat their stroke and lose their productivity as a result, and that's wasteful and bad medical practice. Uh, we've had chronic problems attempting to attract new physicians to Pendleton in the last fifteen years that I've been there. We would. Be, perhaps be successful at getting them to interview, but once their spouses saw that there's no Nordstrom's there, we'd lose them and they'd say thanks a lot, but no thanks. Um, the plan proposed here, from my reading of this bill, says that I, I would expect them to say, well, look, if Pendleton needs primary care docs, <coughs> needs specialists that we don't have there, we're going to pay them more to work there. That's the power of this bill. It's a tool to give access to those services by whatever means necessary to equal out the care. Uh, so some, pay, some doctor's pay may go up. Some doctor's pay may go down. Those that go down a little bit can expect a little bit of a boon from getting paid for every patient they see. That's what this is all about. You know, a lot of us, a lot of the docs write off a percentage of patients because they know they're not going to get compensated. It's, it's done gratis. It's just part of every medical practice. That, that would stop. Um, Mind you, there's now 15 minutes remaining. I'm sorry. Um, there's only a, a few seconds left. Uh, other doctors hire, uh, other countries hire doctors whose sole job it is to drive around and go door to door doing house calls. Uh, this plan would allow someone actually be, to be hired that way if it turned out to be cost effective. The decisions made by the proponents of this bill, or the, the ones who have to administer it, will be based on evidence. It would be, if you can show that there's evidence that it's actually cost effective to do something, they have the power to make it happen. This plan represents an investment in our human infrastructure, something we all benefit from supporting. It takes a positive step toward recovery from the recession and toward becoming competitive again in the global economy. It is a good plan to address a systemic problem. I side with Mark Hatfield, who's been quoted more than once today already. The national defense begins within our borders in the health and education of our people. Can we do this? To quote a famous American, yes, we can. Everybody in, nobody out will work for us. House Bill 3510 will let Oregon once again lead the way in health care reform. I strongly urge your support. Thank you. Co-chairs Greenlick and Thompson, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify in support of a single-payer health care system. And thank you, Representative Michael Dembro, for sponsoring this very important legislation, House Bill 3510. My name is Terry Mills. I am a longtime nurse educator. I'm a proud member of AFT Oregon, and I also serve on the Health Policy Cabinet of the Oregon Nurses Association. In your consideration of HB 3510, you should know that not only do nurses make up the largest sector of the healthcare workforce, year after year, nurses are voted as the profession most trusted by the American public, according to the Gallup poll, and their opinion is valued on providing affordable health care to all. Yet, Despite the commitment of every nurse and every health care provider to provide the best possible care to every Oregonian, our current health care system is failing. At least 639,000 Oregonians, or about 17 percent, are without health insurance. And this number became very real to me when I asked my nursing students at Portland Community College to raise their hands if they were without health insurance. And over two-thirds of a class of 83 raised their hands. It is ironic 
to me that the very people we are educating to become health professionals don't have access to the care they themselves will someday be providing. This is wrong. Even in the nursing profession itself, many of my colleagues are not covered by health insurance because health organizations are choosing to hire on a part-time basis because they won't have to pay very expensive premiums. And nurses who work on the front lines of our health care are all too aware of how this continuing and growing crisis continues to further erode our living standards. We've certainly heard stories from the media. I would like to just share two very brief stories today with you. One was a 30-year-old patient of mine who came into the emergency department with a ruptured appendix that had perforated. He had had symptoms of appendicitis for three days, acute abdominal pain, but chose to wait because he did not want to risk bankrupting his family with an expensive hospital bill. And I will never forget the 45-year-old patient with stage 4 lung cancer who lived exactly one week. She had symptoms for over a year, a productive bloody cough, but didn't choose to seek care because, she, you see, she was taking care of three kids at home as a single mom. Now, I pride myself teaching in the Portland Community College nursing program because we, like all accredited nursing programs in our state, practice with evidence-based um, research. And this means that we deliver nursing care based on science and facts, not what we see or what we hear on television. We need evidence-based policy. And that is why AFT Oregon and the Oregon Nurses Association support HB 3510, because we want our focus to be on keeping our patients well, not on what insurance plan they have and if the care they need will be covered. In closing, every fall I ask my nursing students why they want to be a nurse. And they tell me it's because they want to touch lives, they want to make a difference, and they want to help keep their fellow Oregonians well. Today, you may well be making that kind of a difference for a fellow Oregonian or a neighbor or perhaps even your own family. By voting yes on House Bill 3510, you have the opportunity to create jobs, provide affordable health care for every Oregon resident, resident, alleviate suffering, but most importantly, please recognize by voting yes, you may well be saving a life. Thank you. All right, next panel, which will be the last panel, be uh, Liz Baxter and Mike Huntington. I want to express my appreciation and congratulations to this body for allowing single-payer improved Medicare for all to be on the table. I am Dr. Joe Eusterman from Wilsonville, <coughs> one of the original six Mattis Hell doctors from Oregon, and a member of the 18,000 strong Physicians for a National Health Program. I'm recently retired after 50 years caring mostly for Oregonians. I have been honored by their sharing their health challenges, hopes, and fears. My adv advocacy for House Bill 3510 is how I am now able to continue caring for them, especially to remove their fears of getting sick and losing everything. Exactly that loss of fear that Canadians and most other industrialized and more compassionate nations, citizens, enjoy. I want to uh, just uh, show uh, a t-shirt to this group, this panel. This shows that uh, a World Health Organization ranking of healthcare outcomes around the world. The United States is number 37 down at the bottom. Uh, and I'll, sh I'll also show it to the group behind me. I don't, I don't think most Oregonians want to be 37th in anything. Um, Oregonians are suffering and dying needlessly because they are uninsured, underinsured, and without access to medically necessary care. House Bill 3510 is the fiscally conservative, socially responsible, 
and morally correct and urgently needed solution. Studies, most notably one three years ago by the California Nurses Association, have shown a system of pay, have shown a system of payment as in House Bill 3510 would cover Oregonians at an average of 5% of annual income. $3,000 per year for a family of four earning $60,000 per year as an example. That cannot be anywhere even closely matched by our present pay or die for-profit private health insurance disgrace. Don't believe the conflict of interest tainted opponents who say we can't afford it. I say we cannot not afford it. I'd like to give you a very quick definition of single payer because uh, there's always some question about that and then I will, cl then I will close. Single payer, a system of payment that redirects all monies, both public and private, now being spent for health care into a single fund that covers everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Jay Themeyer, and I'm very honored to have the chance to speak in support of HB 3510. A recent article in the New York Times noted, quote, anyone seriously interested Can you back in up just a bit, please? Thank you. Anyone seriously interested in improving the health of Americans and reducing the cost of health care must be willing to tackle a growing and underappreciated problem, the vast number of patients with more than one chronic illness. I qualify. For almost two decades, during the 80s and 90s, I was on the street drinking myself to death. I have a BS in biology from Washington and Lee University in Virginia, in fact attended medical school at MCV in Richmond briefly during the fall of 69. I didn't leave med school to wind up on the street, but so it goes. Neither did the numbers of laid off workers and vets suffering from PTSD that I met during the early 80s. None of us had health insurance. Thanks to a program in Portland called Project Stop, designed for dual diagnosis low-income people to get their lives reoriented, I got supportive housing and OHP Plus coverage in 2002. For me and others, this program was a huge assist, and it was a major blow when the program was cut as a fiscal austerity measure a year later. I slid under the wire. Today, as a result of a windfall from a relative, I have been bumped off OHP Plus and SSI. When Social Security informed me of my good fortune, what mattered most, of course, was the loss of my health insurance. Like anyone who's been on the street for years, I have numerous pre-existing conditions which prevent mainstream coverage. I now pay out of pocket for all my medical bills. $800 at the counter before being seen by the urologist or ophthalmologist, for instance, who at conclusion of my brief visit recommends that I return in a month for follow-up. I have no choice but to pay, of course. Like every other human being on the planet, my health drives everything else in my life. And I have to wonder how much better it would be for patients if physicians were free to concentrate on care instead of worrying about the bottom line or wasting time wrangling with private insurers. Until recently, I paid monthly premiums to the Oregon Medical Insurance Pool administered, administered by Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield. OMIP, the insurance pool for those who can't get mainstream insurance, didn't cover what I needed. Cataract removal on both eyes, follow-up, additional procedures, rehab, medications, none of it was covered. When they sent notice my monthly premiums would be raised over $700, I canceled. Health is not a personal choice. Medical demands are inescapable. They aren't a privilege which should be reserved to those who can afford it, with costs determined by private insurance industry people. During the time I had OHP coverage, I went to Westside Community Health Clinic. I still go there because I trust them. Their focus is on basic medical care, not the bottom line. They spend time with me, not fending off my concerns, but trying to help me find a solution. Their approach is increasingly rare and precious and unaffordable. Oregon is in a position to do what other states aren't. Universal access to medical care in a system that's coherent, not the fragmented, profit-driven pseudo-system that now exists. 
under HB 3510, no one would be discarded for inability to pay. Fact is, chronic illnesses are especially numerous and trammeling for the poor. The coverage guaranteed by HB 3510 would guarantee a poor person's right to life. It's as stark and humbling as that. Thank you.